those english psychologists who up to the present are the only philosophers who are to be thanked for any endeavor to get as far as a history of the origin of morality these men i say offer us in their own personalities no paltry problem they even have if i am to be quite frank about it in their capacity of living riddles an advantage over their books they themselves are interesting these english psychologists what do they really mean we always find them voluntarily or involuntarily at the same task of pushing to the front of the parti honteuse of our in inner world and looking for the efficient governing and decisive principle in that precise quarter where the intellectual self-respect of the race would be the most reluctant to find it for example in the vis inertiae of habit or in forgetfulness or in a blind and fortuitous mechanism in the association of ideas or in some factor that is purely passive reflex molecular or fundamentally stupid what is the real motive power which always impels these psychologists in precisely this direction is it an instinct for human disparagement somewhat sinister vulgar and malignant or perhaps incomprehensible even to itself or perhaps a touch of pessimistic jealousy the mistrust of disillusioned idealists who have become gloomy poisoned and bitter or a petty subconscious enmity and rancor against christianity and plato that has conceivably never crossed the threshold of consciousness or just a vicious taste for those elements in life which are bizarre painfully paradoxical mystical and illogical or as a final alternative a dash of each of these motives a little vulgarity a little gloominess a little anti-christianity a little craving for the necessary piquancy but i am told that it is simply a case of old frigid and tedious frogs crawling and hopping around men and inside men as if they were th as thoroughly at home there as they would be in a swamp i am opposed to this statement nay i do not believe it and if in the impossibility of knowledge one is permitted to wish so do i wish from my heart that just the converse metaphor should apply and that these analysts with their psychological microscopes should be at bottom brave proud and magnanimous animals who know how to bridle both their hearts and their smarts and have specifically trained themselves to sacrifice what is desirable to what is true any truth in fact even the simple bitter ugly repulsive unchristian and immoral truths for there are truths of that description two all honor then to the noble spirits who would fain dominate these historians of morality but it is certainly a pity that they lack the historical sense itself that they themselves are quite deserted by all the beneficent spirits of history the whole train of their thought runs as was always the way of old-fashioned philosophers on thoroughly unhistorical lines there is no doubt on this point the crass ineptitude of their genealogy of morals is immediately apparent when the question arises of ascertaining the origin of the idea and judgment of the good man had originally so speaks their decree praised and called good altruistic acts from the standpoint of those on whom they were conferred that is those to whom they were useful subsequently the origin of this phrase was forgotten and altruistic acts simply because as a sheer matter of habit they were praised as good came also to be felt as good as though they contained in themselves some intrinsic goodness the thing is obvious this initial derivation contains already all the typical and idiosyncratic traits of english psychologists we have utility forgetting habit and finally error the whole assemblage forming the basis of a system of values on which the higher man has up to the present prided himself as though it were a kind of privilege of man in general this pride must be brought low this system of values must lose its values is that attained now the first argument that comes ready to my hand is that the real homestead of the concept good is sought and located in the wrong place the judgment good did not originate among those to whom goodness was shown much rather has it been the good themselves that is the aristocratic the powerful the high-stationed the high-minded 
who have felt that they themselves were good and that their actions were good that to say of the first order in contradistinction to all the low the low-minded the vulgar and the plebeian it was out of this pathos of distance that they first arrogated the right to create values for their own profit and to coin the names of such values what had they to do with utility the standpoint of utility is as alien and as inapplicable as it could possibly be when we have to deal with so volcanic an effervescence of supreme values creating and demarcating as they do a hierarchy within themselves it is at this juncture that one arrives at an appreciation of the contrast to that tepid temperature which is the presupposition on which every combination of worldly wisdom and every calculation of practical expediency is always based and not for one occasional not for one exceptional instance but chronically the pathos of nobility and distance as i have said the chronic and despotic esprit de corps and fundamental instinct of a higher dominant race coming into association with a meaner race an under race this is the origin of the antithesis of good and bad the master's right of giving names goes so far that it is permissible to look upon language itself as the expression of the power of masters they say this is that and that they seal finally every object and every event with a sound and thereby at the same time take possession of it it is because of this origin that the word good is far from having any necessary connection with altruistic acts in accordance with the superstitious belief of these moral philosophers on the contrary it is on the occasion of the decay of aristocratic values that the antithesis between egoistic and altruistic presses more and more heavily on the human conscience it is to use my own language the herd instinct which finds in this antithesis an expression in many ways and even then it takes a considerable time for this instinct to become sufficiently dominant for the valuation to be inextricably dependent on this antithesis as is the case in contemporary europe for today the prejudice is predominant which acting even now with all the intensity of an obsession and brain disease holds that moral altruistic and disinteresse are concepts of equal value three in the second place quite apart from the fact that this hypothesis as to the genesis of value good cannot be historically upheld it suffers from an inherent psychological contradiction the utility of altruistic conduct has presumably been the origin of its being praised and this origin has become forgotten but in what conceivable way is this forgetting possible has perchance the utility of such conduct ceased at some given moment the contrary is the case this utility has rather been experienced every day at all times and is consequently a feature that obtains a new and regular emphasis with it every fresh day it follows that so far from vanishing from the consciousness so far indeed from being forgotten it must necessarily become impressed on the consciousness with ever increasing distinctness how much more logical is that contrary theory it is not truer for that which is represented for instance by herbert spencer who places the concept good as essentially similar to the concept useful purposive so that in the judgments good and bad mankind is simply summarizing and investing with the sanction its unforgotten and unforgettable experiences concerning the useful purposive and the mischievous non-purposive according to this theory good is the attribute of that which has previously shown itself useful and so is able to claim to be considered valuable in the highest degree valuable in itself this method of explanation is also as i have said wrong but at any rate the explanation itself is coherent and psychologically tenable four the guidepost which first put me on the right track was this question what is the true etymological significance of the various symbols for the idea good which have been coined in the various languages i then found that they all led back to the same evolution of the same idea that everywhere aristocrat noble in the social sense is the root idea out of which have necessarily developed good in the sense of with aristocratic soul noble in the sense of with a soul of high caliber 
with a privileged soul a development which invariably runs parallel with that other evolution by which vulgar plebeian low are made to change finally into bad the most eloquent proof of this last contention is the german word schlecht itself this word is identical with schlecht compare schlechtweg and schlechterdings which originally and as yet without any sinister innuendo simply denoted the plebeian man in contrast to the aristocratic man it is at the sufficiently late period of the thirty years war that this sense becomes changed to the sense now current from the standpoint of the genealogy of morals this discovery seems to be substantial the lateness of it is to be attributed to the retarding influence exercised in the modern world by democratic prejudice in the sphere of all questions of origin this extends as will shortly be shown even to the province of natural science and physiology which prima facie is the most objective the extent of the mischief which is caused by this prejudice once it is free of all trammels except those of its own malice particularly to ethics and history is shown by the notorious case of buckle it was in buckle that the plebeianism of the modern spirit which is of english origin broke out once again from its malignant soil with all the violence of a slimy volcano and with that salted rampant and vulgar eloquence with which up to the present time all volcanoes have spoken five with regard to our problem which can justly be called an intimate problem and which elects to appeal to only a limited number of years it is of no small interest to ascertain that in those words and roots which denote good we catch glimpses of that arch trait on the strength of which the aristocrats feel themselves to be beings of a higher order than their fellows indeed they call themselves in perhaps the most frequent instances simply after their superiority and power for example the powerful the lords the commanders or after the most obvious sign of their superiority as for example the rich the possessors that is the meaning of aria and the iranian and slav languages correspond but they also call themselves after some characteristic idiosyncrasy and this is the case which now concerns us they name themselves for instance the truthful this is first done by the greek nobility whose mouthpiece is found in theognis the megarian poet the word esthlos which is coined for the purpose signifies etymologically one who is who has reality who is real who is true and then with a subjective twist the true as the truthful at this stage in the evolution of the idea it becomes the motto and party cry of the nobility and quite completes the transition to the meaning noble so as to place outside the pale the lying vulgar man as theognis conceives and portrays him till finally the word after the decay of the nobility is left to delineate psychological noblesse and becomes as it were ripe and mellow in the words kakos and in dylos the plebeian in contrast to the agathos the cowardice is emphasized this affords perhaps an inkling on what lines the etymological origin of the very ambiguous agathos is to be investigated in the latin malus which i place side by side with melas the vulgar man can be distinguished as the dark colored and above all as the black haired hich niger est as the pre-aryan inhabitants of the italian soil whose complexion formed the clearest feature of distinction from the dominant blondes namely the aryan conquering race at any rate gaelic has afforded me the exact an analogue fin for instance in the name fingal the distinctive word of the nobility finally good noble clean but originally the blond-haired man in contrast to the dark black-haired aboriginals the celts if i may make a parenthetical statement were throughout a blonde race and it is wrong to connect as virchow still contends those traces of an essentially dark-haired population which are to be seen on the more elaborate ethnological maps of germany with any celtic ancestry or with any admixture of celtic blood it is in this context it is rather the pre-aryan population of germany which surges up to these districts the same is true substantially of the whole of europe in point of fact the subject race has finally again obtained the upper hand in complexion and the shortness of the skull and perhaps in the intellectual and social qualities who can guarantee that modern democracy still more modern anarchy and indeed that tendency to the commune the most primitive form of society 
which is now common to all the socialists in europe does not in its real essence signify a monstrous reversion and that the conquering and master race the aryan race is not also becoming inferior physiologically i believe that i can explain the latin bonus as the warrior my hypothesis is that i am right in deriving bonus from an older duonus compare bellum duellum duenlum in which the word duonu appears to be to be contained bonus accordingly as the man of discord of variance in zweiung, duo as the warrior one sees what in ancient rome the good meant for a man must not our actual german word gut mean the godlike the man of godlike race and be identical with the national name originally the noble's name of the goths the grounds for this supposition do not appear appertain to this work six above all there is no exception though there are opportunities for exceptions to this rule that the idea of political superiority always resolves itself into the idea of psychological superiority in those cases where the highest caste is at the same time the priestly caste and in accordance with its general characteristics confers on itself the privilege of a title which alludes specifically to its priestly function it is in these cases for instance that clean and unclean confront each other for the first time as badges of class distinction here again there develops a good and a bad in a sense which has ceased to be merely social moreover care should be taken not to take these ideas of clean and unclean too seriously too broadly or too symbolically all the ideas of ancient man have on the contrary got to be understood in their initial stages in a sense which is to an almost inconceivable extent crude coarse physical and narrow and above all essentially unsymbolical the clean man is originally only a man who washes himself who abstains from certain foods which are conducive to skin diseases who does not sleep with the unclean women of the lower classes who has a horror of blood not more not much more on the other hand the very nature of a priestly aristocracy shows the reasons why just at such an early juncture there should ensue a really dangerous sharpening and intensification of opposed values it is in fact through these opposed values that gulfs and are cleft in the social plane which a veritable achilles of free thought would shudder to cross there is from the outset a certain diseased taint in such sacerdotal aristocracies and in the habits which prevail in such societies habits which averse as they are to action constitute a compound of introspection and explosive emotionalism as a result of which there appears that introspective morbidity and neurasthenia which adheres almost inevitably to all priests at all times with regard however to the remedy which they themselves have invented for this disease the philosopher has no option but to state that it has proved itself and its effects a hundred times more dangerous than the disease from which it should have been the deliverer humanity itself is still diseased from the effects of the naivetes of this priestly cure take for instance certain kinds of diet abstention from flesh fasts sexual continence flight into the wilderness a kind of weir mitchell isolation though of course without that system of excessive feeding and fattening which is the most efficient antidote to all the hysteria of the aesthetic ideal consider too the whole metaphysic of the priests with its war on the senses its enervation its hair splitting consider its self-hypnotism on the fake air and brahman principles it uses brahman as a glass disc in obsession and that climax which we can understand only too well of an unusual satiety with its panacea of nothingness or god the demand for a unio mystica with god is the demand of the buddhist for nothingness nirvana and nothing else in sacerdotal societies every element is on a more dangerous scale not merely cures and remedies but also pride revenge cunning exultation love ambition virtue morbidity further it can fairly be stated that it is on the soil of this essentially dangerous form of human society the sacerdotal form that man really becomes for the first time an interesting animal that it is in this form that the soul of man has in a higher sense attained depths and become evil 
and those are the two fundamental forms of a superiority which up to the present man has exhibited over every other animal. 7. The reader will have already surmised with what ease the priestly mode of valuation can branch off from the knightly aristocratic mode, and then develop into the very antithesis of the latter. Special impetus is given to this opposition by every occasion when the castes of the priests and warriors confront each other with mutual jealousy and cannot agree over the prize. The knightly aristocratic values are based on a careful cult of the physical, on a flowering, rich, and even effervescing healthiness that goes considerably beyond what is necessary for maintaining life, on war, adventure, the chase, the dance, the tourney, on everything, in fact, which is contained in strong, free, and joyous action. The priestly aristocratic mode of valuation is, we have seen, based on other hypotheses. It is bad enough for this class when it is a question of war. Yet the priests are, as is notorious, the worst enemies. Why? Because they are the weakest. Their weakness causes their hate to expand into a monstrous and sinister shape, a shape which is most crafty and most poisonous. The really great haters in the history of the world have always been priests, who are also the cleverest haters. In comparison with the cleverness of priestly revenge, every other piece of cleverness is practically negligible. Human history would be too fatuous for anything were it not for the cleverness imported into it by the weak. Take at once the most important instance. All the world's efforts against the aristocrats, the mighty, the masters, the holders of power, are negligible by comparison with what has been accomplished against those classes by the Jews. The Jews, that priestly nation which eventually realized that the one method of effecting satisfaction on its enemies and tyrants was by means of a radical transvaluation of values, which was at the same time an act of the cleverest revenge. Yet the method was only appropriate to a nation of priests, to a nation of the most jealously nursed priestly revengefulness. It was the Jews who, in opposition to the aristocratic equation, good equals aristocratic, equals beautiful, equals happy, equals loved by the gods, dared with a terrifying logic to suggest the contrary equation, and indeed to maintain with the teeth of the most profound hatred, the hatred of weakness. This contrary equation, namely, the wretched are alone the good, the poor, the weak, the lowly are alone the good. The suffering, the needy, the sick, the loathsome are the only ones who are pious, the only ones who are blessed. For them alone is salvation. But you, on the other hand, you aristocrats, you men of power, you are to all eternity the evil, the horrible, the covetous, the insatiate, the godless. Eternally also shall you be the unblessed, the cursed, the damned. We know who it was who reaped the heritage of this Jewish transvaluation in the context of the monstrous and inordinately fateful initiative which the Jews have exhibited in connection with this most fundamental of all declarations of war. I remember the passage which came to my pen on another occasion, beyond good and evil aphorism 195, that it was in fact with the Jews that the revolt of the slaves begins in the sphere of morals. That revolt which has behind it a history of two millennia, and which at the present day has only moved out of our sight, because it has achieved victory. 8. But you understand this not? You have no eyes for a force which has taken two thousand years to achieve victory. There is nothing wonderful in this. All lengthy processes are hard to see and to realize. But this is what took place. From the trunk of that tree of revenge and hate, Jewish hate, that most profound and sublime hate, which creates ideals and changes old values to new creations, the like of which has never been on earth, there grew a phenomenon which was equally incomparable, a new love the most profound and sublime of all kinds of love, and from what other trunk could it have grown? But beware of supposing that this love has soared on its upward growth, as in any way a real negation of that thirst for revenge, 
as an antithesis to the jewish hate no the contrary is the truth this love grew out of that hate as its crown as its triumphant crown circling wider and wider amid the clarity and fullness of the sun and pursuing in the very kingdom of light and height its goal of hatred its victory its spoil its strategy with the same intensity with which the roots of that tree of hate sank into everything which was deep and evil with increasing stability and increasing desire this jesus of nazareth the incarnate gospel of the love this redeemer bringing salvation and victory to the poor the sick the sinful was he not really temptation in its most sinister and irresistible form temptation to take the tortuous path to those very jewish values and those very jewish ideals has not israel really obtained the final goal of its sublime revenge by the tortuous paths of this redeemer for all that he might pose as israel's adversary and israel's destroyer is it not due to the black magic of a really great policy of revenge of a far-seeing burrowing revenge both acting and calculating with slowness that israel himself must repudiate before all the world the actual instrument of his own revenge and nail it to the cross so that all the world that is all the enemies of israel could nibble without suspicion at this very bait could moreover any human mind with all its elaborate ingenuity invent a bait that was more than truly dangerous anything that was even equivalent in the power of its seductive intoxicating defiling and corrupting influence to that symbol of the holy cross to that awful paradox of a god on the cross to that mystery of the unthinkable supreme and utter horror of the self-crucifixion of a god for the salvation of man it is at least certain that sub hoc signo israel with its revenge and transvaluation of all values has up to the present always triumphed again over all other ideals over all more aristocratic ideals nine but why do you talk of nobler ideals let us submit to the facts that people have triumphed or the slaves or the populace or the herd or whatever name you care to give them if this has happened through the jews so be it in that case no nation ever had a greater mission in the world's history the masters have been done away with the morality of the vulgar has triumphed this triumph may also be called a blood poisoning it has mutually fused the races i do not dispute it but there is no doubt but that this intoxication has succeeded the redemption of the human race that is from the masters is progressing swimmingly everything is obviously becoming judaized or christianized or vulgarized what is there in the words it seems impossible to stop the course of this poisoning through the whole body politic of mankind but its tempo and pace may from the present time be slower more delicate quieter more discreet there is time enough in view of this context has the church nowadays any necessary purpose has it in fact a right to live or could man get on without it query tour it seems that it fetters and retards this tendency instead of accelerating it well even that might be its utility the church certainly is a crude and boorish institution that is repugnant to an intelligence with any pretense of delicacy to a really modern taste should it not at any rate learn to be somewhat more subtle it alienates nowadays more than it allures which of us would forsooth be a free thinker if there were no church it is the church which repels us not its poison apart from the church we are like the poison this is the epilogue of a free thinker to my discourse of an honorable animal as he has been given abundant proof and a democrat to boot he had up to that time listened to me and could not endure my silence but for me indeed with regard to this topic there is much on which to be silent ten the revolt of the slaves and morals begins in the very principle of resentment becoming creative and giving birth to values a resentment experienced by creatures who deprived as they are of the proper outlet of action 
are forced to find their compensation in an imaginary revenge while every aristocratic morality springs from a triumphant affirmation of its own demands the slave morality says no from the very outset to what is outside itself different from itself and not itself and this no is its creative deed this volte face of the valuing standpoint this inevitable gravitation to the objective instead of back to the subjective is typical of resentment the slave morality requires as the condition of its existence an external and objective world to employ physiological terminology it requires objective stimuli to be capable of action at all its action is fundamentally a reaction the contrary is the case when we come to the aristocrat system of values it acts and grows spontaneously it merely seeks its antithesis in order to pronounce a more grateful and exultant yes to its own self its negative conception low vulgar bad is merely a pale late-born foil in comparison with its positive and fundamental conception saturated as it is with life and passion of we aristocrats we good ones we beautiful ones we happy ones when the aristocratic morality goes astray and commits sacrilege on reality this is limited to that particular sphere with which it is not sufficiently acquainted a sphere in fact from the real knowledge of which it disdainfully defends itself it misjudges in some cases the sphere which it despises the sphere of the common vulgar man and the low people on the other hand due weight should be given to the consideration that in any case the mood of contempt of disdain of superciliousness even on the supposition that it falsely portrays the object of its contempt will always be far removed from that degree of falsity which will always characterize the attacks in effigy of course of the vindictive hatred and revengefulness of the weak in onslaughts on their enemies in point of fact there is in contempt too strong an admixture of nonchalance of casualness of boredom of impatience even of personal exultation for it to be capable of distorting its victim into a real caricature or a real monstrosity attention again should be paid to the almost benevolent nuances which for instance the greek nobility imports into all the words by which it distinguishes the common people from itself note how continuously a kind of pity care and consideration imparts its honeyed flavor until at last almost all the words which are applied to the vulgar man survive finally as expressions for unhappy worthy of pity compare dylos dylaios poneros mokthaeros the latter two names really denoting the vulgar man as labor slave and beast of burden and how conversely bad low unhappy have never ceased to ring in the greek ear with a tone in which unhappy is the predominant note this is a heritage of the old noble aristocratic morality which remains true to itself even in contempt let philologists remember the sense in which oitsuros anolebos klemon dustekain xumora used to be employed the well-born simply felt themselves the happy they did not have to manufacture their happiness artificially through looking at their enemies or in cases to talk and lie themselves into happiness as is the custom with all resentful men and similarly complete men as they were exuberant with strength and consequently necessarily energetic they were too wise to dissociate happiness from action activity becomes in their minds necessarily counted as happiness that is the etymology of oi pratine all in sharp contrast to the happiness of the weak and the oppressed with their festering venom and malignity among whom happiness appears essentially as a narcotic a deadening a quietude a peace a sabbath an enervation of the mind and relaxation of the limbs in short a purely passive phenomenon while the aristocratic man lived in confidence and openness with himself Geneos, noble-born emphasizes the nuance sincere and perhaps also naive the resentful man on the other hand is neither sincere nor naive nor honest and candid with himself his soul squints his mind loves hidden crannies tortuous paths and back doors 
everything secret appeals to him as his world his safety his balm he is past master in silence in not forgetting in waiting in provisional self-depreciation and self-abasement a race of such resentful men will of necessity eventually prove more prudent than any aristocratic race it will honor prudence on quite a distinct scale as in fact a paramount condition of existence while prudence among aristocratic men is apt to be tinged with a delicate flavor of luxury and refinement so among them it plays nothing like so integral a part as that complete certainty of function of the governing unconscious instincts or as indeed a certain lack of prudence such as vehement and valiant charge whether against danger or the enemy or as those ecstatic bursts of rage love reverence gratitude by which at all times noble souls have recognized each other when the resentment of the aristocratic man manifests itself it fulfills and exhausts itself in an immediate reaction and consequently instills no venom on the other hand it never manifests itself at all in countless instances when in the case of the feeble and weak it would be inevitable an inability to take seriously for any length of time their enemies their disasters their misdeeds that is the sign of the full strong natures who possess a superfluity of moulding plastic force that heals completely and produces forgetfulness a good example of this in the modern world is mirabeau who had no memory for any insults and meannesses which were practiced on him and who was only incapable of forgiving because he forgot such a man indeed shakes off with the shrug many a worm which would have buried itself in another it is only in characters like these that we see the possibility supposing of course that there is such a possibility in the world of the real love of one's enemies what respect for the, his enemies is found forsooth in an aristocratic man and such reverence is already a bridge to love he insists on having his enemy to himself as his distinction he tolerates no other enemy but a man in whose character there is nothing to despise and much to honor on the other hand imagine the enemy as the resentful man conceives him and it is here exactly that we see his work his creativeness he has conceived the evil enemy the evil one and indeed that is the root idea from which he now evolves as a contrasting and corresponding figure a good one himself his very self the method of this man is quite contrary to that of the aristocratic man who conceives the root idea good spontaneously and straight away that is to say out of himself and from that material then creates for himself a concept of bad this bad of aristocratic origin and that evil out of the cauldron of unsatisfied hatred the former an imitation an extra an additional nuance the latter on the other hand the original the beginning the essential act in the conception of a slave morality these two words bad and evil how great a difference do they mark in spite of the fact that they have an identical contrary in the idea good but the idea good is not the same much rather let the question be asked who is really evil according to the meaning of the morality of resentment in all sternness let it be answered thus just the good man of the other morality just the aristocrat the powerful one the one who rules but who is distorted by the venomous eye of resentfulness into a new color a new signification a new appearance this particular point we would be the last to deny the man who learnt to know those good ones only as enemies learnt at the same time not to know them only as evil enemies and the same men who inter pares were kept so rigorously in bounds through convention respect custom and gratitude though much more through mutual vigilance and jealousy inter pares these men who in their relations with each other find so many new ways of manifesting consideration self-control delicacy loyalty pride and friendship these men are in reference to what is outside their circle where the foreign element of foreign country begins not much better than beasts of prey which have been let loose they enjoy their freedom from all social control they feel that in the wilderness they can give vent with impunity to that tension which is produced by enclosure and imprisonment in the peace of society 
they revert to the innocence of the beast of prey conscience like jubilant monsters who perhaps come from a ghostly bout of murder arson rape and torture with bravado and a moral equanimity as though merely some wild student's prank has been played perfectly convinced that the poets have now an ample theme to sing and celebrate it is impossible not to recognize at the core of all these aristocratic races the beast of prey the magnificent blond brute avidly rampant for spoil and victory this hidden core needed an outlet from time to time the beast must get loose again must return into the wilderness the roman arabic german and japanese nobility the homeric heroes the scandinavian vikings are all alike in this need it is the aristocratic races who have left the idea barbarian on all the tracks in which they have marched nay a consciousness of this very barbarianism and even a pride in it manifests itself even in their highest civilization for example when pericles says to his athenians in that celebrated funeral oration our audacity has forced a way over every land and sea rearing everywhere imperishable memorials of itself for good and for evil this audacity of aristocratic races mad absurd and spasmodic as may be its expression the incalculable and fantastic nature of their enterprises pericles sets in special relief and glory the Ramuthia of the athenians their nonchalance and contempt for safety body life and comfort their awful joy and intense delight in all destruction in all the ecstasies of victory and cruelty all these features become crystallized for those who suffered thereby in the picture of the barbarian of the evil enemy perhaps of the goth and of the vandal the profound icy mistrust which the german provokes as soon as he arrives at power even at the present time is always still an aftermath of that inextinguishable horror with which for whole centuries europe has regarded the wrath of the blonde teuton beast although between the old germans and ourselves there exists scarcely a psychological let alone a physical relationship i have once called attention to the embarrassment of hesiod when he conceived the series of social ages and endeavoured to express them in gold silver and bronze he could only dispose of the contradiction with which he was confronted by the homeric world an age magnificent indeed but at the same time so awful and so violent by making two ages out of one which he henceforth placed one behind the other first the age of the heroes and demigods as that world had remained in the memories of the aristocratic families who found therein their own ancestors secondly the bronze age as that corresponding age appeared to the descendants of the oppressed spoiled ill-treated exiled enslaved namely as an age of bronze as i have said hard cold terrible without feelings and without conscience crushing everything and bespattering everything with blood granted the truth of the theory now believed to be true that the very essence of all civilization is to train out of man the beast of prey a tame and civilized animal a domesticated animal it follows indubitably that we must regard as the real tools of civilization all those instincts of reaction and resentment by the help of which the aristocratic races together with their ideals were finally degraded and overpowered though that has not yet come to be synonymous with saying that the bearers of those tools also represented the civilization it is rather the contrary that is not only probable nay it is palpable today. these bearers of vindictive instincts that have to be bottled up these descendants of all european and non-european slavery especially of the pre-aryan population these peoples i say represent the decline of humanity these tools of civilization are a disgrace to humanity and constitute in reality more of an argument against civilization more of a reason why civilization should be suspected one may be perfectly justified in being always afraid of the blonde beast that lies at the core of all aristocratic races and in being on one's guard but who would not 
a hundred times prefer to be afraid when one at the same time admires than to be immune from fear at the cost of being perpetually obsessed with a loathsome spectacle of the distorted the dwarfed the stunted the envenomed and is that not our fate what produces today our repulsion toward man for we suffer from man there is no doubt about it it is not fear it is rather that we have nothing more to fear from men it is that the worm man is in the foreground and pululates it is that the tame man the wretched mediocre and unedifying creature has learned to consider himself a goal and a pinnacle an inner meaning and historic principle a higher man yes it is that he has a certain right so to consider himself in so far as he feels that in contrast to that excess of deformity disease exhaustion and effeteness whose odor is beginning to pollute present-day europe he at any rate has achieved a relative success he at any rate still says yes to life twelve i cannot refrain at this juncture from uttering a sigh and one last hope what is it precisely which i find intolerable that which i alone cannot get rid of which makes me choke and faint bad air bad air that something misbegotten comes near me that i must inhale the odor of the entrails of a misbegotten soul that accepted what can one not endure in the way of need privation bad weather sickness toil solitude in point of fact one manages to get over everything born as one is to a burrowing and battling existence one always returns once again to the light one always lives again one's golden hour of victory and then one stands as one was born unbreakable tense ready for something more difficult for something more distant like a bow stretched but tauter by every strain but from time to time do ye grant me assuming that beyond good and evil there are goddesses who can grant one glimpse grant me but one glimpse only of something perfect fully realized happy mighty triumphant of something that still gives cause for fear a glimpse of a man that justifies the existence of man a glimpse of an incarnate human happiness that realizes and redeems for the sake of which one may hold fast to the belief in man for the position is this in the dwarfing and leveling of the european man lurks our greatest peril for it is this outlook which fatigues we see today nothing which wishes to be greater we surmise that the process is always still backwards still backwards towards something more attenuated more inoffensive more cunning more comfortable more mediocre more indifferent more chinese more christian man there is no doubt about it grows always better the destiny of europe lies even in this that in losing the fear of man we have also lost the hope in man yea the will to be man the sight of man now fatigues what is present-day nihilism if it is not that we are tired of man thirteen but let us come back to it the problem of another origin of the good of the good as the resentful man has thought it out demands its solution it is not surprising that the lambs should bear a grudge against the great birds of prey but that is no reason for blaming the great birds of prey for taking the little lambs and when the lambs say among themselves those birds of prey are evil and he who is as far removed from being a bird of prey who is rather its opposite a lamb is he not good then there is nothing to cavil at in the setting up of this ideal though it may be also that the birds of prey will regard it as a little sneeringly and perchance say that to themselves we bear no grudge against them these good lambs we even like them nothing is tastier than a tender lamb to require of strength that it should not express itself as strength that it should not be a wish to overpower a wish to overthrow a wish to become master a thirst for enemies and antagonisms and triumphs is just as absurd as to require of weakness that it should express itself as strength a quantum of force is just such a quantum of movement will action rather it is nothing else 
than just those very phenomena of moving willing acting and can only appear otherwise in the misleading errors of language and the fundamental fallacies of reason which have become petrified therein which understands and understands wrongly all working is conditioned by a worker by a subject and just exactly as the people separate the lightning from the flash and interpret the latter as a thing done as the working of a subject which is called lightning so also does the popular morality separate strength from the expression of strength as though behind the strong man there existed some indifferent neutral substratum which enjoyed a caprice and option as to whether or not it should express strength but there is no such substratum there is no being behind doing working becoming the doer is a mere appendage to the action the action is everything in point of fact the people duplicate the doing when they make the lightning lighten that is a doing doing they make the same phenomenon first a cause and then secondly the effect of that cause the scientists fail to improve uh, matters when they say force moves force causes and so on our whole science is still in spite of all its coldness of all its freedom from passion a dupe of the tricks of language and has never succeeded in getting rid of that superstitious changeling the subject the atom to give another instance is just such a changeling just as the kantian thing in itself what wonder if the suppressed and stealthily simmering passions of revenge and hatred exploit for their own advantage their belief and indeed hold no belief with a more steadfast enthusiasm than this that the strong has the option of being weak and the bird of prey of being a lamb thereby do they win for themselves the right of attributing to the birds of prey the responsibility for being birds of prey when the oppressed downtrodden and overpowered say to themselves with a vindictive guile of weakness let us be otherwise than evil namely good and good is every one who does not oppress who hurts no one who does not attack who does not pay back who hands over revenge to god who holds himself as we do in hiding who goes out of the way of evil and demands in short little from life like ourselves the patient the meek the just yet all this in its cold and unprejudiced interpretation means nothing more than once for all the weak are weak it is good to do nothing for which we are not strong enough but this dismal state of affairs this prudence of the lowest order which even insects possess which in a great danger are fain to sham death so as to avoid doing too much has thanks to the counterfeiting and self-deception of weakness come to masquerade in the pomp of an ascetic mute and expectant virtue just as though the very weakness of the weak that is forsooth its being its working its whole unique inevitable inseparable reality were a voluntary result something wished chosen a deed an act of merit this kind of man finds the belief in a neutral free choosing subject necessary from an instinct of self-preservation of self-assertion in which every lie is fain to sanctify itself the subject or to use popular language the soul has perhaps proved itself the best dogma in the world simply because it rendered possible to the horde of mortal weak and oppressed individuals of every kind that most sublime specimen of self-deception the interpretation of weakness as freedom of being this or being that as merit fourteen will any one look a little into right into the mystery of how ideals are manufactured in this world who has the courage to do it come here we have a vista opened in these grimy workshops wait just a moment dear mr inquisitive and foolhardy your eye must first grow accustomed to this false changing light yes enough now speak what is happening below down yonder speak out tell what you see man of the most dangerous curiosity for now i am the listener i see nothing i hear the more it is a cautious spiteful gentle whispering and muttering together in all the corners and crannies it seems to me that they are lying a sugary softness adheres to every sound weakness is turned to merit there is no doubt about it it is just as you say further and the impotence which requites not is turned to goodness 
craven baseness to meekness submission to those whom one hates to obedience namely obedience to one of whom they say that he ordered this submission they call him god the inoffensive character of the weak the very cowardice in which he is rich his standing at the door his forced necessity of waiting gain here fine names such as patience which is also called virtue not being able to avenge oneself is called not wishing to avenge oneself perhaps even forgiveness for they know not what they do we alone know what they do they also talk of the love of their enemies and sweat thereby further they are miserable there is no doubt about it all these whisperers and counterfeiters in the corners although they try to get warm by crouching close to each other but they tell me that their misery is a favor and distinction given to them by god just as one beats the dog one likes best that perhaps this misery is also a preparation a probation a training that perhaps it is still more something which will one day be compensated and paid back with a tremendous interest in gold nay in happiness they call this blessedness further they are now giving me to understand that not only are they better men than the mighty the lords of the earth whose spittle they have to lick not out of fear not at all out of fear but because god ordains that one should honor all authority not only are they better men but that they also have a better time at any rate will one day have a better time but enough enough i can endure it no longer bad air bad air these workshops where ideals are manufacturers verily they reek with the crassest lies nay just one minute you are saying nothing about the masterpieces of these virtuosos of black magic who can produce whiteness milk and innocence out of any black you like have you not noticed what a pitch of refinement is attained by the chef d'oeuvre the most audacious subtle ingenious and lying artist trick take care these cellar beasts full of revenge and hate what do they make forsooth out of their revenge and hate do you hear those words would you suspect if you trusted only their words that you are among men of resentment and nothing else i understand i prick my ears up again ah 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 i hold up my nose now do i hear for the first time that which they have said so often we good we are the righteous what they demand they call not revenge but the triumph of righteousness what they hate is not their enemy no they hate unrighteousness godlessness what they believe in and hope is not the hope of revenge the intoxication of sweet revenge sweeter than honey did comer call it but the victory of god of the righteous god over the godless what is left for them to love in this world is not their brothers in hate but their brothers in love as they say all the good and righteous on the earth and how do they name that which serves them as a solace against all the troubles of life their phantasmagoria of their anticipated future blessedness how do i hear right they call it the last judgment the advent of their kingdom the kingdom of god but in the meanwhile they live in faith in love in hope enough enough fifteen in the faith in what in the love for what in the hope of what these weaklings they also forsooth wish to be strong some time there is no doubt about it some time their kingdom also must come the kingdom of god is their name for it as has been mentioned they are so meek in everything yet in order to experience that kingdom it is necessary to live long to live beyond death yes eternal life is necessary so that one can make up forever for that earthly life in faith in love in hope make up for what make up by what dante as it seems to me made a crass mistake when with awe-inspiring ingenuity he placed that inscription over the gate in his hell me too made eternal love at any rate the following inscription would have a much better right to stand over the gate of the christian paradise in its eternal blessedness me too made eternal hate granted of course that a truth may rightly stand over the gate to a lie for what is the blessedness of that paradise possibly we could quickly surmise it but it is better that it should be explicitly attested by an authority who in such matters is not only to be disparaged thomas of aquinas the great teacher and saint beati in regno celesti says he as gently as a lamb 
videbunt pernis damnatorum ut beadito illis magis compliciat or if we wish to hear a stronger tone a word from the mouth of a triumphant father of the church who warned his disciples against the cruel ecstasies of the public spectacles but why faith offers us much more says he de spectac chapter twenty nine following something much stronger thanks to the redemption joys of quite another kind stand at our disposal instead of athletes we have our martyrs we wish for blood well we have the blood of christ but what then awaits us on the day of his return of his triumph and then does he proceed does this enraptured visionary at enum supersunt alia spectacula ille ultimus et perpetuus judici dies ille nationabius insperatus ille derisus cum tanta sceculi vestustas et tot edius nativitates uno igne hariuntur quae tunc spectaculi latido quid admire quid ridcam ubi gaudeam ubi exultem spectans tot et tantos regnes qui in caelum recepti nuntiabor cum ipso jove et upses tuis testibus in imis tenebris congemenses item presides the provisional gov governors persecutores dominici nominis seviborus quam ipsi flammes severient insulatibus contra cristelos liquiscentes quos preteria sapientes illus philosophos corum disculipus suis una conflagritibus erup decentes quibus nihil ad deum pertinere sua debant quibus animas aut nullas aut non in pristina corpora redituras affirmabant etiam poetas non an radamanti nec an minios sed ad inobinati christi tribunal palpitantes tuc magis tragiodi audiendi magisciliset vocales with louder tones and more violent shrieks in sua propria calamitate tunc histriones cognoscende solutiores multiple ignem tunc spectandus origa in flamia rota totis rubens tunc existi contemplandi non in gymnasis sed in igne jaculati nisi quodne tunc quidem illos velem vivos ut qui malam ad eos proteus conspecnum insatadiebilem conferre qui in dominum severivrunt hi est illes dicam fabri aut quotie storiae filius as is shown by the whole of the following and in particular by this well-known description of the mother of jesus from the talmud tertullian is henceforth referring to the jews sabati destructor samarites et demonium habens hic est quem a juda redemnites hic est ille arundine et colafis de vertepalas sputamentis de decoratas fele et accento potatus hic est quem clanu discente sublipurunt et resurrexisse dicatar vel hortalanus detraxit net lacuto sue frequentia commentiam ledienrentur ut talia spectes ut talibus exultis quis tibi pretur at consul aut sacerdos de sua liberala tete presitibunt et tamen hoc iam hebimus codamundo per fidem spiritu imaginante representata ceterum qualia ilia sunt quae nec oculus vidit nec auris audivit nec in cor hominis ascelederunt credo circo et ultraque cavia first and fourth row 
or according to others the comic and the tragic stage et omni studio gratiore perfidem so stands it written sixteen let us come to a conclusion the two opposing values good and bad good and evil have fought a dreadful thousand-year fight in the world and though indubitably the second value has been for a long time in the preponderance there are not wanting places where the fortune of the fight is still undecisive it can almost be said that in the meanwhile the fight reaches a higher and higher level and that in the meanwhile it has become more and more intense and always more and more psychological so that nowadays there is perhaps no more decisive mark of the higher nature of the more psychological nature than to be in that sense self-contradictory and to be actually still a battleground for those two opposites the symbol of this fight written in a writing which has remained worthy of perusal throughout the course of history up to the present time is called rome against judea judea against rome hitherto there has been no greater event than that fight the putting of that question that deadly antagonism rome found in the jew the incarnation of the unnatural as though it were its diametrically opposed monstrosity and in rome the jew was held to be convicted of hatred of the whole human race and rightly so in so far as it is right to link the well-being and the future of the human race to the unconditional mastery of the aristocratic values of the roman values what conversely did the jews feel against rome one can surmise it from a thousand symptoms but it is sufficiently to carry one's mind back to the johannian apocalypse that most obscene of all the written outbursts which has revenge on its conscience one should also appraise at its full value the profound logic of the christian instinct when over this very book of hate it wrote the name of the disciple of love that self-same disciple to whom it attributed that impassioned and ecstatic gospel therein lurks a portion of truth however much literary foraging may have been necessary for this purpose the romans were the strong and aristocratic a nation stronger and more aristocratic has never existed in the world has never even been dreamed of every relic of them every inscription in raptures granted that one can divine what it is that writes the inscription the jews conversely were that priestly nation of resentment par excellence possessed by a unique genius for popular morals just compare with the jews the nation with analogous gifts such as the chinese or the germans so as to realize afterwards what is first rate and what is fifth rate which of them has been provisionally victorious rome or judea but there is not a shadow of a doubt just consider to whom in rome itself nowadays you bow down as though before the quintessence of all the highest values and not only in rome but almost over half the world everywhere where man has been tamed or is about to be tamed to three jews as we know and one jewess to jesus of nazareth to peter the fisher to paul the tent maker and to the mother of the aforesaid jesus namely mary this is very remarkable rome is undoubtedly defeated at any rate there took place in the renaissance a brilliant sinister revival of the classical ideal of the aristocratic valuation of all things rome herself like a man waking up from a trance stirred beneath the burden of the new judaized rome that had been built over her which presented the appearance of an ecumenical synagogue and was called the church but immediately judea triumphed again thanks to that fundamentally popular german and english moment of the revenge which is called the reformation and taking also into account its inevitable corollary the restoration of the church the restoration also of the ancient graveyard peace of classical rome judea proved yet once more victorious over the classical ideal in the french revolution and in a sense which was even more crucial and even more profound the last political aristocracy that existed in europe that of the french seventeenth and eighteenth centuries broke into pieces beneath the instincts of a resentful populace never had the world heard a greater jubilation a more uproarious enthusiasm indeed there took place in the midst of it the most monstrous and unexpected phenomenon the ancient ideal itself swept before the eyes and conscience of humanity with all its life and with unheard-of splendor and in opposition to resentment's lying war cry of the prerogative of the most in opposition to the will of the lowliness 
abasement and equalization the will to a retrogression and twilight of humanity there rang out once again stronger simpler more penetrating than ever the terrible and enchanting counter-war cry of the prerogative of the few like a final signpost to the other ways there appeared napoleon the most unique and violent anachronism that ever existed and in him the incarnate problem of the aristocratic ideal in itself consider well what a problem it is napoleon that synthesis of monster and superman seventeen was it therewith over was that greatest of all antitheses of ideals thereby relegated at acta for all time or only postponed postponed for a long time may there not take place at some time or other a much more awful much more carefully prepared flaring up of the old conflagration further should not one wish that consummation with all one's strength will it oneself demand it of oneself he who at this juncture begins like my readers to reflect to think further will have difficulty in coming quickly to a conclusion ground enough for me to come myself to a conclusion taking it for granted that for some time past what i mean has been sufficiently clear what i exactly mean by that dangerous motto which is inscribed on the body of my last book beyond good and evil at any rate that is not the same as beyond good and bad note i avail myself of the opportunity offered by this treatise to express openly and formally a wish which up to the present has only been expressed in occasional conversations with scholars namely that some faculty of philosophy should by means of a series of prize essays gain the glory of having promoted the further study of the history of morals perhaps this book may serve to give a forcible impetus in such a direction with regard to a possibility of this character the following question deserves consideration and merits quite as much the attention of philologists and historians as actual professional philosophers what indication of the history of the evolution of morals is afforded by philology and especially by etymological investigation on the other hand it is of course equally necessary to induce physiologists and doctors to be interested in these problems of the value of the valuations which have been prevailed up to the present in this connection the professional philosophers may be trusted to act as the spokesmen in intermediaries in these particular instances after of course they have quite succeeded in transforming the relationship between philosophy and physiology and medicine which is originally one of coldness and suspicion into the most friendly and fruitful reciprocity in point of fact all tables of values all the thou shalts known to history and ethnology need primarily a physiological at any rate in preference to a psychological elucidation and interpretation all equally require a critique from medical science the question what is the value of this or that table of values and morality will be asked from the most varied standpoints for instance the question of valuable for what can never be analyzed with sufficient nicety that for instance which would evidently have value with regard to promoting and erase the greatest possible powers of endurance or with regard to increasing its adaptability to a specific climate or with regard to the preservation of the greatest number would have nothing like the same value if it were a question of evolving a stronger species engaging values the good of the majority and the good of the minority are opposed standpoints we leave it to the naivete of english biologists to regard the former standpoint as intrinsically superior all the sciences have now to pave the way for the future task of the philosopher this task being understood to mean that he must solve the problem of value that he has to fix the hierarchy of values this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey church